complexity theory is related to the concept of how do we understand the running time of computational algorithms. It is a topic that is covered extensively in the domain of computer science and uh, in fact there are probably complete courses on uh, uh, fundamentals of programming, complexity theory, algorithms and complexity theory basically. Right? Some of you may have done courses on data structures and algorithms in which you may have come across some study of complexity theory. What I am planning to do over here is not really go into any amount of depth into either algorithm analysis or data structures or anything of that sort. But what I do want to convey over here is a sort of specific uh, concept which is important to the understanding of the overall uh, analysis of electronic design automation algorithms. Okay. So let's start with the idea of what is a computer, what do we mean by computation, right? So the first thing, it needs to have a processing unit which means that it is capable of certain types of so-called elementary operations. Right? So what is an elementary operation? It is, I mean, one sort of uh, intuitive way of thinking about it is to say that, you know, things like addition, subtraction, logical comparisons, uh, checking whether A is less than B, or, you know, bitwise operations, all of those are what we can consider as elementary operations. In other words, arithmetic. But at the same time, even something like, you know, fetching data from memory, writing data back into memory is usually considered an ele elementary operation. In fact, branching, that is to say, jumping to a new position in a code, that particular step of branching by itself can be considered an elementary operation. So one way to think about it might be that these are the instructions of a computer. But on the other hand, uh, from the point of view of complexity theory, we are not restricted to that. We could also choose to take significantly more complicated operations and treat them as elementary. The main point over here is that the amount of time required to execute an elementary operation should not depend on the type of input or the kind of input or the size of the input that we are dealing with. Okay, that will become a bit more clear as we go further. A computer also needs some kind of storage. Right? Typically, this is memory. It would be the RAM of the system itself. It will also have, of course, its own internal register files inside the CPU, right? where temporary storage is available and you can keep your variables. But it could also include something like disk access, which is sort of the bulk storage. But on the other hand, from a practical point of view, it's typically much slower. What else? We also need a program. Right? We need to give the, this computer, this processor plus memory, instructions on what to do. And the program that we are talking about is basically what we consider as an algorithm. So an algorithm is a sequence of steps. Right? We already saw that in the earlier uh, session on what we mean by algorithms in the first place. And the program itself is just any algorithm which has been encoded into machine language. That is the instructions of the particular computer that we are considering. So, what is a program? It's, as I said, an algorithm or a sequence of steps that has been encoded into the machine language. The machine language or the machine instructions are themselves specific to the processor that you choose. Okay? So, for example, if you have an Intel x86, then it has the so-called x86 instruction set architecture. Right? So, this term instruction set architecture or ISA is a very uh, important concept from the point of view of a computer architect, right? a person who designs and builds computers. There are open instruction set architectures. Right? Nowadays, the most popular one probably is this one called RISC-V. So you might have heard of RISC-V. RISC-V is by itself not a processor. It is an instruction set architecture. Right? It defines how a machine is supposed to, how a computer, that is whatever you implement, is supposed to interpret certain machine instructions. And that's the main idea. Once you have defined the instruction set architecture, you really don't care about how the, com the processor itself has been implemented after that. Right? It gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do. Now, in addition to the instruction set architecture, you also assume that there is some ability to store variables. Right? That is to say, you can define certain locations in memory to have specific important values. And you can perform operations either on variables that are directly in memory 
or those variables are considered to be inside registers inside the CPU itself. So once again, you know, coming back to an elementary operation, this is basically the idea here is that this is something that a computer can perform in a unit time or constant time, right? So that's all it means. It does not mean one clock cycle. It could mean 10 clock cycles. It could mean 100 clock cycles, provided that that time remains constant irrespective of the program that you are trying to run. So let's take an example, right, to understand how we could come up with algorithms, right, what kind, what an algorithm might look like, how you would describe it, and how you would analyze it. Okay, those are the main parts if you're interested. So probably the most common example that is used for explaining algorithms in complexity would be something like sorting, right. So on the top row, basically you can see that I have a number of integer values, each one in its own box. And what I want to do is to sort these, right? That is to say, I want to take those values and put them into the correct locations in the lower set of boxes, such that they are in ascending order. Okay? So how would you go about doing this? What kind of algorithm can you think of for solving a problem of this sort? Right? And what I'm going to do is to start by presenting one very simple and trivial kind of uh, algorithm, one which is very easy to understand, may not be the most efficient from a practical point of view. Right? So what would that be? One way of looking at it is, I just scan through the upper list and find the smallest number. In this case, it happens to be 1, right, which I have marked in red over here. Okay? Once I have found that location, I can safely say that this particular number, the smallest value over here, must go into the first location in the lower row, right? In other words, I have found the appropriate location for the smallest number that is present over here, right? So far, so good. Now, what do I do next? One thing that I could choose to do is to once again scan through from the beginning, right? I, I always start from the beginning. That is the leftmost number. I now scan through and find the second smallest number. What do I mean by the second smallest number? I need to make sure that I am looking at numbers that have not already been marked and sorted. Okay, so anything marked in red, in other words, I have to skip over. So I find 5 in this case and it goes down into its appropriate location on the lower row. Proceed like this, the next value that I find is 15. Remember that, you know, I said I need to skip over the 5 because it has already been marked red, that is it's been sorted. Put 15 in its appropriate place proceed like this, right? The next number is 23, it goes into its location, then comes 36, then comes 42, 58, and finally 97, okay? So in this process, if I look at it, the green row has exactly the same set of numbers as the original, but now in sorted order, right? So everything has been put in ascending order. Okay, so how would I encode this as an algorithm? And what I've written over here, so one thing to keep in mind, right? I mean, you'll notice that I have a few different formats that I use for representing code as we go uh, forward over here. The program that I've written over here is sort of in a C-like language, right? Uh, the reason why I'm saying it is C-like is that every now and then you will find that, you know, this does not really match with any construct in C or C++ that you know of. In which case, I'm basically saying that, you know, I mean, you understand what I mean. So ignore the syntax errors and just move forward. Okay. So syntax errors is something that, uh, you know, in general, I do not believe in sort of uh, learning any syntax of any language by heart. Even now, even though I've written so many languages in C and Python, I need to go on to Google and search for the syntax of even, you know, trivial uh, statements every now and then. Right. So that's why I'm saying if there are syntax errors, ignore them, right? And of course, I will also, the same holds for you as well. If I if I ask you to write an algorithm and it is not syntactically correct in any language, I will, I'm not bothered about that. What I do want is that the meaning or what you are trying to do should be clear, right? Unfortunately, that is a little subjective. It might be clear to you and not clear to me, but, you know, so try your best to make sure it's as clear as possible. In a, for cases where, you know, for the quiz, for example, if you, in case you have to write a small piece of code. Anyway, coming back to the algorithm, 
so the sequence of steps that we have over here is, you know, I have a for loop. What do I do with the for loop? I'm going to scan for the ith smallest number, right? So I start by basically setting. In other words, this for loop, the way that it's working is, I'm going from i equal to 0 to n minus 1. Right? And what I'm saying is, at each time, once again, I'll set min equal to infinity, min location equal to minus 1, and try to find the actual min value and the min location. Right? But what I'm going to do is that I will update the min value only if it has not already been sorted. Right? That is to say, the value has not already been sorted. So the sorted of j, I'm assuming is some kind of a array or a set or a hash map, whatever you want it to be, which indicates that, which indicates basically a Boolean value about the jth input. Right? Has the jth input already been sorted? If so, then skip over it. Right? And uh, if it has not been sorted and it turns out that this condition is satisfied, that is x of j is less than min, then update both the value and the location. And finally, insert it into the correct location. Okay? So these are the sequence of steps in the algorithm itself. Let's try and do and try and identify what we mean by elementary operations in this case. So you can get an idea of what I mean, right? So min equal to infinity. Assignments, for example, these are assignment operations. This would probably be some copy value to register or to memory, right? And uh, it's obvious to understand, uh, you know, why these would be considered as elementary operations. But it's actually not as simple as that because in practice what you might find is that on a real computer the time required to store some data into a register versus the time required to store it into memory or in fact even the time required to store it into memory depending on whether it's in cache or whether it's in DRAM or whether it has been swapped out to disk can actually vary significantly. right? But we are ignoring all of that and saying irrespective of all of that we consider an assignment operation to be unit time, an elementary operation. Okay. Similarly, what we have over here is comparison and condition checking, right? Once again, I consider this to be an elementary operation. And in fact, what I'm saying is further than that, multiple such elementary operations together can be considered as one elementary operation. Okay? And similarly, these are also assignments. Once again, they are elementary operations. So if I have all of these as elementary operations, that is each one of these steps by itself takes a unit amount of time, then the question that arises is, is there any part of this algorithm that is not unit amount of time and more importantly, that depends on some parameter of the input, right? And in this case, the parameter that I'm interested in is this value n. Right? This is the number of values to be sorted and I take this to be the size of my input. Okay. So I am basically going to treat the number of values to be sorted as the size of the input and not really worry about what kind of values are being sorted. In this case of course it was integers but even that is not very obvious, right? Were they 8-bit integers or 16-bit integers or 32-bit or 64-bit were the integers represented directly as let's say 32-bit values or were they represented as character arrays right so all those different ways in which you can store the input can make a difference to the size of the input that we are talking about all of that we are ignoring and we are saying that I don't really care about the size of an individual value I want to know what is the sort of variable over here Right? So n, in other words, is the one thing which determines how many values are to be sorted. And that is basically what I'm going to look at as the size of my input. Which means that I have these two for loops. Right? This is going to run n times. Right? And so is this going to run n times. I put a tilde n over there, but that does not mean approximately. It basically means that it is running n times, but the amount of time it takes internally is basically going to be proportional to n. 
right? So perhaps a better uh, notation over here might actually be to say proportional to n. Okay. So both of these loops are going to are typically going to run a number of times, which is proportional to the number of values to be sorted. And with that in mind, we can now define something called algorithmic complexity, which basically tells us how does the running time of an algorithm grow with the size of the input. Right? So we already saw that in our case, the size of the input was the number of values to be sorted. We also saw that the elementary operations are assumed to take the unit amount of time independent of n. Right? So that is what I meant by, I don't really care about if they take one clock cycle or several clock cycles as long as that number does not depend on n, the size of the input. Okay. And the important thing to keep in mind over here is that we are typically concerned about how it grows with the size of the input. That is to say, as the input size becomes larger and larger, how does the running time increase? So, in the example that we were looking at for sorting, right, the input size was n. That is the number of values to be sorted. And as you saw, we have two nested for loops. Right? And what that means is that the overall running time that we have is now going to be proportional to n for the outer loop into n for the inner loop, or in other words, n squared. Right? So that's all that we can really say over here, that this running time is now proportional to n squared. Okay. So I could write it something like this, t of n is equal to some c into n squared, where c is a constant of proportionality. And the important point over here is, I don't care what the value of c is. Right? All that I care is the fact that there is a proportionality over here. And as long as that is there, you know, the actual internal value of c, I don't care too much about. Why is this important? Because what it means is that it doesn't matter whether I'm going to run this on a, you know, an ARM processor or an Arduino or an x86 uh, Xeon, right? The c values will be different in each of those cases, the constant of proportionality. But the fact that the running time grows as n squared is pretty much going to be the same for any different kind of processor that you come up with. Now, having said that, other algorithms are possible, right? The basic algorithm that we looked at, right, I call it sort of a scan sort or whatever. It's not even the selection sort exactly. It is sort of related to this concept called the selection sort where I pick up the uh, n, uh, the ith smallest value at each iteration and put it into its correct location. Okay? So this is uh, what I described to you was sort of a form of selection sort. As we saw, its runtime goes as O of n squared. This big O notation, right? So this is sometimes called big O notation. And this essentially means that proportionality factor that I told you, right? The actual meaning is a little bit more subtle than that. It talks about, you know, uh, the limiting case of functions and the fact that in the worst case, you could actually have, there, there is a function which bounds the running time by something into n squared. Okay? So that is essentially what the notation is talking about. Uh, the intuitive meaning is that you can expect the runtime to go as, uh, go proportional to n squared. In this case. Okay. On the other hand, there are other known algorithms, right? So there is something called a quick sort, right? And other variants called the heap sort, merge sort, and so on. A quick example, and without going into the details of how any of those sorting algorithms works, I just want to show one approach that is used in order to implement something like this. What it says is, let's say that you're trying to sort 16 numbers, right? So n is equal to 16 in this case. What recursive algorithms try to do or at least recursive algorithms like quicksort try to do, is they break this input into smaller parts. Okay, So now I've broken it into two parts, each of size n equal to 8. Okay? And now effectively what I'm saying is if I can solve each of those individual parts, the n equal to 8 parts efficiently, then I should be able to reassemble the values and get back 
the larger on uh, the final result. Similarly, break the n equal to 8 down to 4 blocks of n equal to 4. Continue to 1. At this point, I don't have any further breaking down to do. Which means that I go into the next phase of the algorithm, reassembly. Right? That is to say, I say, okay, now I have broken it down into its edge cases, the leaf cases of a tree, so to say. Right? How much work do I need to do over here? This Effectively, what I'm saying is, I need to scan through n values, n partitions, each of which has one value, right? It's not very clear what it means in this case to actually scan through a partition with one value. There's no comparison to do over here. But when I go to 2, for example, I find that I can basically compare edges and numbers and swap their positions if they need to be swapped, right? Go further up, I can... I am effectively saying that I can make use of the information from 2 in order to solve the problem for 4. Okay? And similarly go up to 8 and finally to 16. Okay? So the total work done over here in other words is some n steps of work, right? whatever that might be, plus n plus n plus n plus n. Right? The number of stages, since I'm always breaking down by a factor of 2, is going to be given by log to base 2 of n, right? Probably some ceiling value over here, but I'm, you know, generally we prefer to think in terms of n either being powers of 2 or more importantly, we're anyway talking about larger and larger values of n, n tending to infinity, so that ceiling is not really a big deal, right? You put both of these together and what we find is the running time goes as n into log to base 2 of n, right? Now, given the nature of the log function, what this means is that this is much better than O of n squared. It is significantly faster, especially for large values of n. Now, having said that, there is yet another kind of algorithm that I can come up with for sorting, right? Which is basically, you have n numbers to sort, Fine, generate all possible permutations of those numbers and look at the permutation and go through and say which one is in sorted order, right? Let's say that I have the values 3, 4, 1, 2, right? What do I do? I basically go through all of the options over here. 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, etc. Right? In this case, with 4 values, there are 24 permutations. One of them is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's going to give you the correct answer. Right? This is a horribly inefficient way to do sorting, but it is correct. As far as algorithms go, it is correct and it is optimal. It will always give you, it's guaranteed to give you the correct answer. The problem is running time order of n factorial, because that is the number of permutations that we are dealing with. Right? And n factorial essentially goes as n power n. Right? So it's much worse than n squared or n cubed or anything. It's basically the moment you hit n factorial, it is even worse than an exponential. An exponential would be something 2 power n or 3 power n. Whereas n factorial is basically n power n. Okay? So what this means in other words is that it's possible to come up with a spectacularly poor algorithm from the point of view of running time, but which is still correct.